تجربة بنغالية هاتي دي I mean, I don't have to ask if there are any Pakistanis in the audience, but I want to know about other ethnicities. North Africans? North Africans? I mean, nothing? Afghanis? Afghanis? Irani? Nothing? Just Pakistanis? Huh? Okay, good. Right. Urdu? <laughs> okay. I'll just make some first. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Wa mathalu al-lazina kafaru ka mathali al-lazhi yan'iqu bima la yasma'u illa du'a'an wa nida'a. Summun bukmun umyun fahum la ya'qilun. رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقه قولي فالحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين اما بعد وان سكن ايفري السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته the example from the Quran that we're going to try to contemplate today together is ayah number 171 of surah al-baqarah it's an, a very peculiar example uh, a rough translation of this example is something like uh, you know when allah says wa mathalu alladhina kafaru the example of those who've disbelieved. Uh, it's something like the example of, of one who calls or cries out. Yan'iqu uh, is used for the shepherd when he's trying to call his sheep. That's what, what the lexicons tell us about this word. So he's comparing it to a shepherd who calls out to the animals, he doesn't mention the animals directly, he said, بِمَا لَا يَسْمَعُ إِلَّا دُعَاءً وَنِدَاءً He calls to something that cannot hear except calls and cries. So the shepherd is making this call and cry, and of course the animals hear him say that. Uh, and then, سُمُّنْ بُكْمُنْ عُمْيُنْ فَهُمْ لَا يَعْقِلُونَ The same, similar language to what we saw in the first parable. We saw, سُمُّنْ بُكْمُنْ عُمْيُنْ فَهُمْ لَا يَرْجِعُونَ And now we're seeing, سُمُّنْ بُكْمُنْ عُمْيُنْ فَهُمْ لَا يَعْقِلُونَ That they're deaf. They're mute, which means they can't speak. Uh, and they're blind, and they're not going to be thinking or understanding. Okay, so this it seems a little obscure at first. Um, there's a tall order ahead of me. I want to place this example in its context so that we can make the most sense of it, inshallah. Uh, and then we'll try to unpack what's going on in this image that Allah is sharing of you know animals being herded and the shepherd making a call and the animals hearing the sound of the call, etc. So the place I want to begin is a, f a little bit further back. Already a couple of times in the surah, I've talked to you about uh, those who influence and the people that are influenced, leaders and followers, right? And we're going to keep some of that narrative alive and keep going with it. Now, so I'm going to start, work back, and start with ayah number 159. That those who... No doubt about it, those who hide the book after we've sent it down. Well, who are the people who were hiding the book that Allah, after Allah sent it down? It was the scholars of the Israelites, the rabbis in Medina, the, the, the knowledgeable people who knew that some of the things the Qur'an is saying were already found in their book. If they told their public that, then a lot of people in their public would start accepting Islam and they would, lead, they would lose their audience and then the fundraiser would be a lot more difficult the next week. You understand? So they can't afford to lose their audience. So they're hiding what they have because it's not just about losing your people in terms of religion. It's a business. And it's also a social thing because they have a large following and the large following gives them social position in society. If they start sharing these things and they start losing people that are going to walk out of their religion, then they're going to lose their position in society. Of course, if you accept Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa as the messenger of Allah, then you're no longer the scholar. You're just a follower among other followers. You lost your whole position, 
right? Everything's gone. All your title, all your education, all everybody looking up to you, coming to you and asking you questions, all of that disappears overnight because you accepted Muhammad Rasulullah. So Allah describes those leaders as those who hide the book deliberately even after Allah has made it clear. Now interesting language, What Allah made clear for all people. Meaning the, the Qur'an was not meant for some select group of scholars, it was meant for the entire public. And the, the, the scholars who were hearing the Qur'an, the scholars of the other religions, were hearing the Qur'an and they knew this is dangerous. Because they were used to keeping information to themselves, and that way the public, if they want to learn anything, they have to come to them. And they will give what they feel like giving and keep the rest to themselves. Just like, for example, the copies of the, you know, the, the original copies of the Bible uh, were not allowed in the possession of the general public in Catholic faith. Right? They were kept in the archives in, you know, in the Vatican. And only the highest order of priests, etc. would have access to it. Until the Protestant Revolution, it was illegal for a Christian to have a copy of the Bible or to even read from the Bible. It was considered blasphemous. Right? So they were, there, there's a structure in religious orders where the only people who know the religion are on top, the rabbis, the priests, etc., and everybody else knows nothing. And if you want to know, you better go th to them. And you can't, you don't know how to worship yourself. You don't know how to answer any questions yourself. And you can't question them because they're the only ones who know. I, it's a silly example, but it's, I think it's s somewhat similar. Uh, if you don't know anything about cars, you don't know anything about a transmission, you don't know anything about a, you know, the, the, the brake pads, you don't know anything about fluids, coolant, nothing. You know nothing. When you go to the mechanic, and all you needed was an oil change. And you go to the mechanic, and he says, you need a new engine, you need a new transmission, you have this belt problem, you have this issue. Oh, your car is going to explode in the next three hours if you don't. It's a, it's a big job, but I can do it. I'll give you a discount, only 10000 You know, He could do that to you. Why? What's, what's the one thing that's allowing him to take advantage of you? Your ignorance. You don't know. That's why he could do it. If you know anything about cars, you say, oh, so there's an engine problem. Can you show it to me? Oh, it's over. no, actually, it's working fine. So where, where's the problem? I don't understand. It's, the rotors are fine. This is fine. This part is fine. This part's fine. The fluid is working quick, you know, working just fine. The, the, the belt is working function. He's like, how do you know about the belt? How do you know about that? And now he, he's kind of, he doesn't like this customer because this customer has too much information. Do you understand? So they were hiding it for a reason. Now, the reason I'm spending time on this is I want you to understand that psychology. You know, before the coming of Islam, which was a revolution, religions operated in a certain way. Religions were designed to control populations. They were designed to control populations. And they were, all, pretty much every major religion was married to the government, whichever government, okay? So the king, in the old times, he needs to make sure that the people are loyal. But the people never, in the whole history of humanity, people don't like government. Like, you don't like your government. Like, I don't like my government. People don't like government. We don't like any... In fact, we don't even like a little bit of government. When you're in school, you don't like your teacher. It's a mini government in the classroom. You don't like it. And the higher... Even inside the school, the principal is the one you're scared of and you don't like... Oh, I hate them. You know. Because there's authority. You don't like when the police officer stops you. Because human beings don't like authority. So the king, in order to hold on to his authority, needs something that will keep the people from rebelling. And one of the tools he uses is not just the military or the police. One of the tools that kings have used in history, governments have used in history, is religion. So get the religious guy, whether it's you know, Buddhism or Hinduism or Christianity, etc., etc. You get the, the, the religious leader to go and when they gather the people on a Sunday or they gather them on a Saturday, it doesn't matter which day, when they gather the people and they're praying, He's going to say, you know, God has given us a great gift, and that gift is the king. Or the gods have blessed this king, and he's chosen him for us. Or this is, you know, so they, they, they marry the government and the religion together. So now the people who want to follow a religion, they're like, it's part of our religious duty to be loyal to the king also. Right? So, you know, so, so there's this kind of conflation between the two. And that's why you have, in, even in European, many European nations, the coronation ceremonies for royal families, etc. There's always some church member involved, even now. But that's coming from a historical, you know, conflation between these two entities. But even at a smaller level, that happened. You know, religious leaders, you know, politicians, when they're going for elections, you know where they go? A lot of times they go to synagogues, they go to churches, they go to mosques. 
They go to religious centers because they say, if we can get the, the religious leader to after the khutbah or after the, Saturday, you know, the Sabbath sermon or the Sunday service to say a few words about this candidate or this candidate, this is going to be good for us. Right? So this will be the religious vote. So this, this, this conflation between you know, po how politics uses religion. And then re religion is not free. <laughs> so a lot of these corrupt religions, you know what they do? Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll endorse you. I'll make you the, you know, the Jesus candidate. But I mean, our church needs a new roof. And we need a new parking. And I've, I haven't had a raise for a long time. And you know, we, we, we for, you know, for the Lord, we need a new helicopter. So, so then the politician will put some money coming their way, and they're going to become their mouthpiece, you see? So this, this system is in place in small ways and in big ways all over the world. And by the way, I'm not afraid to say it, the Muslims are not immune from this disease. Islam has been used in this way also in our history. And even in this day and age, it is used in many places in this way. The religion being used to endorse political objectives. This is done all the time. So it's not like because we have the pure word of Allah and the pure sunnah of his messenger وسلم, that we are pure. No, the book is pure. The sunnah is pure. Our application can be very impure sometimes. right? So they're hiding it. They're hiding parts of it to steer their population. Kind of like how sheep are steered by the shepherd. You understand? And they hide parts of the book that make you think. So I'll keep going because if I could just stay on this ayah, we won't get to the example. إِلَّا الَّذِينَ تَابُوا وَأَصْلَحُوا وَبَيَّنُوا فَأُولَٰئِكَ أَتُوبُوا عَلَيْهِمْ وَأَنَا التَّوَابُ الرَّحِيمُ Except those among them who repented, corrected themselves, and then clarified. What does clarified mean? Clarified means they spoke up. They said, yes, this is in, in fact in our book. You know, this is in fact the truth. Which is the opposite of what word? Bukmun. Remember they don't speak? They can't speak? So they actually بَيَّنُوا uh, فَأُولَٰئِكَ أَتُوبُوا عَلَيْهِمْ Then those are the people whose tawbah I will accept وَأَنَا التَّوَابُ الرَّحِيمُ And I am continually, repeatedly accepting repentance, always loving and caring. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا وَمَاتُوا وَهُمْ كُفَّارُ أُولَٰئِكَ عَلَيْهِمْ لَعْنَةُ اللَّهِ وَالْمَلَٰئِكَ وَالنَّاسِ أَجْمَعِينَ And those who disbelieved and they died while they were in a state of disbelief, those are the people on whom Allah has sent His curse and uh, Allah's curses on them and the angels and people all together. This is not just an ayah about all kuffar. There's a context here. What's the context? Those people who know the truth when it came to them, they hid it anyway. Some of them made tawbah. Allah says, فَأُولَٰئِكَ أَتُوبُوا عَلَيْهِمْ The other ones don't want to make tawbah. They keep one holding on to their power. Those people are being described as إِنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا وَمَاتُوا وَهُمْ kuffar. So there's a general application, but there's an application in, in, in this context. Okay. خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا لَا يُخَفَّفُ عَنْهُمُ الْعَذَابُ وَلَهُمْ يُنْظَرُونَ وَإِلَاهُكُمْ إِلَاهٌ وَاحِدٌ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُوَ الرَّحْمَنُ الرَّحِيمُ It's an incredible ayah. He says they will remain in that curse, that la'na. And then they, the punishment will not be made any lighter on them and they won't even be looked at and they won't be given any breaks. And then he says, and your ilah, your loving object of worship, meaning Allah, is إِلَاهٌ وَاحِدٌ There's only one ilah. No one is to be worshipped or obeyed and loved in any way, shape, or form except He. He is Ar Rahman Ar Rahim. He's ultimately loving and caring, and He's the always loving and caring. Now, what does that have to do with the rest of these ayat? Like, that's an ayah about Tawheed, right? La ilaha illa huwa Ar Rahman Ar Rahim. What's that doing in the middle of ayat that are talking about the rabbis who were hiding the book, or religious authorities that were hiding the book? And He's talking to us. He's not talking to them now. So, you, you notice the sigha was ghaib. It was they hide the book. Inna ladina yaktumuna ma anzalallah. Allah. But here you find wa ilahukum ilahun wahid. He's talking to you. He's talking to me. He says, Your God is the one and the same. This isn't just about Tawheed. There's another from, from in Balagha we say Ma'ani al Thawani. There's a second meaning here. And the second meaning here is if you think that those people were hiding parts of what Allah revealed and Allah cursed them, then don't think that you're special because that's exactly what they thought. They thought they were special. Your God is the same exact God that they had. So the policy for them is the same policy for you. You were, you were just made a new ummah. These ayat just came. And now Allah is giving us example of those who are not accepting this message and then switching that over back to us and saying, by the way, you are in danger of making the same mistakes, but make no mistake, that same ilah is your ilah. So if he did that with them, he will do that with you. However, he is ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. <laughs> لا إله إلا هو 
ar rahman ar rahim meaning if you follow the right way you become you re- receive the rahma of allah become ibad ar rahman so this is the ishara in, in in the speech for us to learn from their mistake not just to look at them and say ha look at these people but actually we're in danger too now this is where things get really cuz i'm all building up to this example that allah gave of the shepherd and the sheep and all of that right ان في خلق السماوات والارض واختلاف الليل والنهار والفلك التي تجري في البحر بما انزل الله so and then he says والفلك التي تجري بما ينفع الناس وما انزل الله من السماء من ماء فاحيا به الارض بعد موتها وتصريف الرياح والسحاب المسخر بين السماء والارض لا ايات لقوم يعقلون really important ayah again it seems like it's going away from the subject it's not going away from the subject كتاب احكمت اياته the ayat of the Qur'an are stitched together for a reason. So what is this ayah saying? No doubt in the creation of the skies and the earth, and the conflict of the night and the day, وَاخْتِلَافِ اللَّيْلِ وَالنَّهَارِ And the ships that sail in the, in the middle of the seas, that bring benefit to the people, بِمَا يَنْفَعُ النَّاسِ Which benefit the people. وَمَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مِنْ مَا And what, uh, whatever, what, whatever water Allah sent down from the sky, that gives life to the earth, وَتَصْرِيفِ الرِّيَاحِ And the movement of the winds in one direction and the other direction. وَالسَّحَابِ الْمُسَخَّرِ And the clouds that are hanging between the skies and the earth. بَيْنَ السَّمَاءِ وَالْأَرْضِ لَآيَاتٍ In all of that, there are plenty of indications, signs, lessons for people that want to think. That people that are trying to understand. Allah is commenting on people that are trying to think and understand. Now this is really, really important. Why? Because Allah gave revelation, the Qur'an, to the people before us, the Torah, the Injil. He gave us these revelations so that we can think. But even before the coming of revelations, you still had the sky, you still had the clouds, you still had the mountains, you still had the ocean. Allah made you capable of thinking. He didn't make you like other animals. He didn't make me like a cow or a sheep or a goat or a dog that can eat, sleep, procreate and die. That's it, that's all it does. But I can look at the same food and say, why is this food being given to me? I can look at the cloud that rains and not just be happy that it rained. Why is that there? Who put that there? And why am I benefiting from it? Human beings were made capable of asking deeper questions. Where did those deeper questions come from? They came from our ruh. They came from the ruh that Allah put inside us. Allah gave us an ability to think about things in a way that other creatures can't think about them. So He gave us these ayat already and then on top of all of that, He gave us the ayat of revelation. The signs and indications of revelation. So if you're already a thoughtful human being, and then the revelation comes, immediately you recognize it. So they immediately, مِمَّا عَرَفُوا مِنَ الْحَقِّ They can recognize it from what's, what's of the truth in it. Because you're already thinking along these lines, and it keeps confirming what you already had inside you. Right? And that's, that's, this is the imagery that Allah is giving, meaning human beings are meant to be thoughtful. Now, let's pause here for a second and think about this. Allah first mentioned religious leaders that try to corrupt their population, right? You know how they corrupt their population? I said they hide some things. Okay, if you're hiding some things, then what are you showing? You have to show the part of the religion that makes people emotional and they don't think too much. So you have to create an entire version of the religion. The whole purpose of that version is to get people emotional and excited. Either you want to make people cry, or you want to make people angry, or you want to make people scared. That's it. That's it. So for example, in our deen, in Islam, in the, in the revelation Allah gave us, if you hear about Tawbah, you might cry. If you hear about Jahannam, you might get scared. If you hear about Jannah, you might get motivated. Isn't that true? If you hear about the, you know, the, the accolades, the history, the exciting history of the past, you might even feel ashamed. We did this and now we're not doing it. There are emotions attached. But our religion is not just about emotional speeches, is it? That's there. It's there. It affects us. But that's not all there is. That's one part of our deen. And the other part of our deen is actually thoughtful, strategic. There's, there's, hik, there's kitab, there's hikmah, there's deeper thinking, there's law. There's society to think about, history to learn from, lessons to learn, right? So there's not just the emotional stuff. Now imagine if every khutbah for 30 years is... And everybody's like, Takbir! And then, this is all your Islam is. Your Islam is just emotional, dopamine hits. You know? Motivate, oh, that khutbah, oh, woke me up. You know? And you're not, that's it, that's all your Islam is. It's just fiery, fiery speech. I love that khutib. Yo, he's, he got loud. 
Oh, you got to go to this one. This one gets sold out. Oh, ho, ho. And it's, what are you watching, the UFC? Or are you, you attending a khutbah? <laughs> Sometimes that's okay. It's a good thing. Sometimes it's okay. But you know what people, what, what corrupt religious leaders do? Corrupt religious leaders don't want people to use their minds. And the best way to not let them use their minds is to create a religion which is all focused on their emotions. You know, feel good, feel good religion and feel bad religion. Just make them laugh and make them cry. That's it. That's all you need. I went one time uh, a few years ago during Christmas. I went to a uh, Joel Olstein special. Joel Olstein, if you don't know, is a very famous preacher in, uh, in Texas, in America. And his sermons are very, very, very well attended. Like he'll have 100,000 people in the crowd. He gets entire stadium, the entire stadium filled up. And he had a Christmas special. I live in Dallas. He had a Christmas special in Dallas the night of Christmas, 25th in the evening. Christmas special with Joel Olstein and family. I was like, okay, I'm going. I want to know what they do. So I went. Some of you may have heard me talk about this before. So I went there. And I got a $25 ticket, which was way up in the corner back seat. So you imagine the first row seats? That must have been serious money. And he's there. And I'm like, what? It's a, it's a four-hour program. I just really want to know how they do that. What that are they, they giving the people? What are they telling them? And one after the, his mother-in-law comes, his wife comes, and his... Somebody else, and then he came, and they're, they're telling people this stuff. Weird things. They're just saying weirdest, the weirdest things. And every, every time they say something, they say, now we're going to sing. And then they bring out a song, everybody starts going, you know, <laughs> starts singing. And I'll just share one thing with you. He said, he said this year, the Lord's going to solve all your problems. And the, even the people next to me, yes, he is. Yes, he is. <laughs> and then, <laughs> I was like, this year? That job that you lost, you're going to get a better job. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. The Lord's promising you this is the year of your due. There was a verse in the Bible about due, you know, the, the morning mist, right? And he used that to say, this is the year of the Lord. This is the year of due, right? And th there was an economic crisis that year afterwards. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> but, but, but he's promising people this like, and people are so happy like, yes. You know, it's, everything's going to work out. He's selling them feel-good religion. And sometimes they sell things. They don't even make sense. How are people buying this stuff? His, his mother-in-law came. Oh, no, it was his wife. She said, this morning, when I was thinking about this Christmas special, I was having myself a chocolate milk. Okay, and I was like, where is this going? Because Allah gives amthal. These people also give amthal, you know? So this is her mathal. This is the mathal uh, chocolate milk. She's like, and I poured the chocolate... And I was stirring it up. And I realized, in life, you just got to stir things up. You just got to stir up your life. And everybody around me is like, yep, stir it up. You got to stir it up. I was like, what does that mean? <laughs> and they were inspired by the stir of the chocolate milk. But this, this, is, um, this is a kind of looking at your deem that just plays with your emotions. And when you're always playing with your emotions, what are you not using? Your mind. What does this ayah tell you? Even without the coming of revelation, the cloud will make you use your mind. The wind blowing will make you use your mind. The night and day, the changing of the night and day will make you use your mind. Allah created this creature, this human being, with a profound mind that looks at the universe and says, there's something beyond this universe. The, mount, the mind is so profound that the more you contemplate the world, the more you want to know what's behind this world. And then Allah answers that question with His revelation. And so you really exhaust your mind thinking about what Allah has said. But these people want to hide what Allah has said. And they want to replace it with things that keep you from using your mind. They just want you to become mindless, I'm going to say it now, sheep. They just want you to be sheep and just follow. Don't think about it too much, just follow. Allah says, there are those who put other people besides Allah as competitors. They love them the way they should be loving Allah. And those who believe, they are intense in their love for Allah. And if only those who did wrong could see the, the moment that they see the punishment that power entirely belongs to Allah. Who is Allah talking to? Allah is talking to the corrupt leaders that are corrupting the masses. And He's talking to the corrupted masses. 
just because they're corrupt leaders doesn't mean you're stupid, that you can't think for yourself. Just because a million people are doing stupid things doesn't mean that you became a sheep because they became sheep. When I was studying psychology back in the university days, in social psychology, we studied riots. One of the chapters we studied was riots. Very interesting phenomenon. You have, for example, a power outage, right? Or there's a, there's a police emergency, and all the police are gone. All of a sudden, something happens to people. Normal guy, accountant, you know, n normally he's a dentist. He has a, and he's taking a broken fire hydrant and he's throwing it into an electronic store and he's grabbing a big screen TV. He has a TV at home. He doesn't even have room for it. He's taking it anyway. He's like, and then they, get, they caught some of these people because they're on camera, right? And they caught some of these people. Why'd you do it? I don't know. Everybody was doing it. I, I just got, what do you mean everybody was doing it? You know? Animals, when they stampede, when one horse starts running fast, the second one, the third one, what happens to all the other horses? They start stampeding. They, they don't think about it. They just do it. Even if one of them is just jumping off of a cliff and they don't know there's the edge of a cliff, the, the horse alone would never do it. But if one of them is doing it super fast, guess what the rest of them are going to do? One after, they won't even look. They're like, hey, he's going. Must be going the right way. Don't go do it. Jump right off the cliff. And so you have something in social psychology, you have something called herd mentality. You think like a herd. And you develop an emotional attachment to those leaders. Because it's, it's, not, an, it's not an intellectual attachment, it's an emotional attachment. So Allah mentions those who love others as though they should be loving Allah. Love is mentioned because this is not an intellectual thing, this is an emotional thing. And they'll realize in the end that power only belongs to Allah. Now Allah makes a comment about the leaders and the followers. As if, you know, you would think Allah will blame the leaders and Allah will give the followers a blank check. No, no, no. Allah comes after the leaders and Allah comes after the followers. Because you were both equipped with the intellect. Right? If they were really smart at making you feel dumb, you were smart enough to not be dumb. Allah says, إِذْ تَبَرَّأَ الَّذِينَ اتُّبِعُوا مِنَ الَّذِينَ اتَّبَعُوا وَرَأَوا الْعَذَابِ وَتَقَطَّعَتْ بِهِمُ الْأَسْبَابِ When those who used to be followed, the influencers the celebrities, the political leaders, the religious leaders, the, you know, the, the, um, the, the people that had huge fan bases, on Judgment Day, when they do tabarru, tabarru means they have their millions of followers, and they say, I have nothing to do with you. They say, Those people will say, we're following you today too. And they're like, no, 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 <laughs> I don't know you people. And they're, com they're coming in front of Allah doing tabarru, like I have no connection, I don't have no idea who these people are. If you, if you rewind the same person, a few years ago when they were alive, they're holding a concert, they got a million fans in front. I love all you guys, I, leave, I love every single one of you. You're in my heart. And everyone's like, we love you too. You're my, you don't have your picture on my phone. You know, and they're having spiritual moments while they're in a concert, they're crying. You know, while the guy's singing a song, his song speaks to me, man. It's like he's talking about my life. You know, I was, this guy's deep, bro. And that guy, that guy, you're, you're a huge fan, standing right next to him on judgment, and he's like, I, don't got, I got nothing to do with this dude. Those who were followed will disconnect themselves from those who followed them. And they'll all be looking at the punishment. Combines either just the leaders, but leaders and also followers. And all the connections they used to have have been chopped up. There's no connection left. وَقَالَ الَّذِينَ اتَّبَعُوا And those who used to follow them, they will now cry out, لَوْ أَنَّ لَنَا كَرَّةً فَنَتَبَرَّأَ مِنْهُمْ If we had another chance to go back, we would cut ourselves off from them, we would say we have nothing to do with them, just like they're saying they have nothing to do with us now. كَذَلِكَ يُرِيهِمُ اللَّهُ أَعْمَالَهُمْ حَسَرَاتٍ عَلَيْهِمْ وَمَا هُمْ بِخَارِجِينَ مِنَ النَّارِ That's how Allah will show them their deeds, so they can keep feeling regret on top of regret on top of regret. Let me build this up for you as we go. Back in the day, there used to be religious leaders. People followed them. And on Judgment Day, they will cut themselves off. The, 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 the Buddhist speaker in Nepal, you know, the, the preacher, who's got a crowd of two, three hundred thousand in front of them, will come in front of a line, cut himself off from his entire congregation. The people who used to climb a 20,000 step mountain just to go, you know, touch the feet of the, the shaman at the top of the temple. The shaman at the top of the temple is like, yeah, I don't, no, please push them back down the mountain. I have nothing to do with them. You know, they banked off of these people, now they're cutting themselves off from them. But what about now? What about nowadays? 
Well, nowadays, our, our, you know, mashallah, our, the next generation of the world, you don't need to go to a temple. Your temple's on TikTok. Temple on Instagram. Your temple's on whatever other social media platform, or Discord, you know? And you follow certain people. The way people used to follow their religious leaders and their political leaders, now we follow celebrities, gamers, singers, comedians, athletes. And you follow their, you know, their personal profile, where they're traveling, what they, you want to keep up with their life, you want to, you want to see what they ate, you want to see where they're, where they're hanging out. Oh my God, look at this picture. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And you're following, following, following. You know? Hit follow and like. Hit follow and like. And Judgment Day, unfollow, unlike. Yeah, that's not my account. That's not, I don't know who these people are. You know? And this, this entire idea of those who have influence being followed is now being rendered nothing on Judgment Day. Nothing. This is all, also, you have to understand, this is a multi-billion dollar industry now. Religion got replaced with consumerism for the most part in most of the world, right? What used to be religion, religion was a way of getting people together and consume things together. Now, you know, large corporations in the world figured out, you don't need that. You just need a good advertising strategy. So get a, get, show as many women in the world as possible that having a Louis Vuitton or a Chanel bag is a status that you are better than other women. You are more accomplished. You are, you are higher, you're, you're a higher prize. And make sure that when, they buy, when you buy one, you make sure you put it on the dinner table when you go somewhere. Lay it in front. For men, their status, a watch is a status symbol. You know, what, what, there's 1,500 pound belts. A belt. A nara. <laughs> right? whose only purpose is to keep your clothes on you, is now a status. You, you could buy one for 20, or you could buy one for 2,000. Why are you buying one for 2,000? Because you see the... Who's going to look? Why do you need that? You know, because there's a new religion now. And in that religion, if you want to have value, then you better buy this product. You better buy this. And they, you know, I used to, when I was in, in college in 1836, I, we, I took a lot of marketing and advertising. One of my minors was marketing and advertising. And one of the most important things I learned in marketing and advertising was you have to, you have to attack one of the most primal urges of your market. So if you want to sell something, you've got to sell people safety because safety is a primal urge. Sell sex, it's a primal urge. Sell, you know, beautification. That's a primal urge. Sell social hierarchy. If you're driving this car, you know, they'll show you that the guy driving this car is just cooler than everybody. Everybody's looking at him. When this car's going on the road, it's like no other car even exists. And now you feel like, if I have this car, oh, I will feel like I'm up here. And everybody will say, Ya layta lana mithla ma utiya qaroon. You know? Why do you want to buy that belt? Because uh, it's a great belt. Why? No, but it's made of leather, which came from a cow. And there are many cows that died, and they don't have Louis Vuitton on them. And they don't have Mont Blanc on them. They don't, they don't have a brand, but they're also cows. And they also got turned into a belt. So tell me why you want this one. Well, because then people will know that I'm not cheap. Ah, people will know. People will know. People will know that you belong to a higher herd. Herd mentality, another primal instinct. Advertisers want to poke at one of your primal in instincts to sell you something. Many young people want to go to a certain university, not because they want to get a good education, but because they'll get to say, I went to that university. I graduated from fill in the blank, Oxford. Right? You, gra you graduate from there, great institution, but the reason you want to go, is it the education or is it that your parents want to be able to say, our boy? Mm -hmm. The prestige of it, that now you belong to a different herd, right? 
sell people these things. And once you sell people, this is what success looks like, like herds, following that standard, like everybody's going to follow that standard. And it doesn't just happen with youth, it happens with elders, it happens with different cultures. You have, for example, people want to get uh, their, their, their uh, daughter married, or their son married, and, you know, the economic times are tough for many people. But you can't just get married and have a simple wedding. You got to get, you got to have that hall that your cousins got for their daughter's wedding. And now if you get anything cheaper than that, then they're going to say, ha, you know where we had it. And look at where you're having it. So now this is about keeping up with the status. That becomes your new religion. Everything else can be compromised. You take a riba loan, go into debt. Go and make some haram money, whatever, but you got to please that God, the God of status, right? So you don't have to have a statue now, you can just have status, <laughs> right? So this is, these are the disconnections that are going to be made on Judgment Day. This is the mindlessness that's being sold to us, and we don't even know why. We don't even know why, why we're doing it. So he says, you know, لو أن لنا, the, the people on Judgment Day say, if we had another chance, فَنَتَبَرَّأَ مِنْهُمْ كَمَا تَبَرَّأُوا مِنَّا كَذَلِكَ يُرِيهِمُ اللَّهُ أَعْمَالَهُمْ حَسَرَاتٍ عَلَيْهِمْ وَمَا هُمْ بِخَارِجِنَا مِنَ النَّارِ Now look at this. يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ كُلُوا مِمَّا فِي الْأَرْضِ حَلَالًا طَيِّبًا People consume whatever you may find within the earth that is halal, good and pure. Now Allah is coming to the point. You should be concerned. What should you get for yourself in this life? What's the only metric? Something that's halal, good and pure. Allah removed what from, you, from the... Get something that competes with someone else. Get something that makes you feel like you're above somebody else. Get something that... He, just all those concerns are gone. Just one concern. Just make sure it's halal, good and pure. وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا خُطُوَاتِ shaitan, And don't end up following the footsteps of the shaitan. Why is the shaitan being mentioned now? Because shaitan was obsessed with comparing himself with Adam. And now you're, you and I are buying things or following things and consuming things all driven by one thing. Comparison, 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 comparison. Let shaitan go is basically let comparison go. Let comparison go. وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا خُطُوَاتِ shaitan. There's another really important element here, and I know I've shared a lot with you, but I, I want you to keep up with me here on this piece. Allah put something in us that makes us profound thinkers. Allah put in us the ruh. And now that Allah is mentioning shaitan, there's a subtle point that I want to bring to your attention. When Allah created Adam alayhi salam, before Allah created Adam alayhi salam, He told all the angels He's going to make him. Before, he, before we were made, Allah told the angels, and that included at the time Iblis too, He made the announcement that He's going to be making a human being, and He also told us, told the angels how He will make him. إِنِّي خَالِقٌ بَشَرًا مِنْ طِينَ I'm going to make a, crea- a, a bashar, a human being, made of mud, dirt. But then he said, فَإِذَا سَوَّيْتُهُ وَنَفَخْتُ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِي فَقَعُوا لَهُ سَاجِدِينَ And when I'm done balancing him and perfecting him, and then I'll blow into him my ruh, then fall into sajda. So now Allah told all of the angels, we have dirt, and we also have what? We have also what? Ruh. The angels know we have two things. We have a physical body and we have a ruh inside us. The angels know this. We have something you can see, and something you cannot see. Something that is earthly, which is our body, dirt. And something that is beyond this earth. That's why it thinks about things that are beyond this earth. Which is what? The ruh. The ruh. That gives us profound deep thinking. When Iblis, you guys know the story. When Iblis refused to do sajda. What was his complaint? He said, you made me from fire. You made him from what? He didn't say you made him from dirt and a ruh. He said, you made him from? From clay. He didn't even mention the ruh. But did he know about the ruh? He did. He wants to pretend that the ruh isn't even there. And he wants us to believe that we're worth nothing because we shouldn't be employing using the gift that Allah gave us. And if you take the ruh out of the equation for a moment, then all we are is a body. And if we're just a body, we're not that different from sheep. We're not that different from goats. We're just organic creatures. Students that study biology, before they can do surgery on a human being, they cut up a frog. Because the cardiovascular system of a frog is remarkably similar to a human being. 
biologically speaking, we have features that aren't that different from animals. The makeup in the end is different, but biologically, many of the, actually the components, the core components, the, the, the organic materials inside of our body, they're not different from the animal kingdom. We have skin, they have skin. We have hair, they have hair. We have bones, they have bones. And their bones are not made of a different material. It's made of the same material. What sets human beings apart, truly apart? It's not just a remarkable body, it's the ruh. And if shaitan can get you away from honoring the ruh that you've been given, then, then he will make his point. Then he is just dirt. Then he is better. When these leaders keep you from thinking, when Allah said, I'm created, you know, in the skies and the earth, there are signs for people who think, aren't those people who respect the ruh inside them? And when these people follow, first of all, those who want to create a religion where you don't think, and the ones who create it, and the ones who are following it, aren't they both violating the ruh? Isn't that the case? So he says, Consume what is halal, good and pure, and don't follow the footsteps of shaitan. He will command you to, to, to evil and to shameless things, and you'll say things on behalf of Allah that you have no knowledge of. So interesting. When it is said to them, follow what Allah sent down, قَالُوا بَلْ نَتَّبِعُوا مَا أَلْفَيْنَا عَلَيْهِ أَبَاءَنَا when it's said to them, follow what Allah sent down, they say, we will find whatever we found our fathers following. We're going to follow our culture. We have a heritage. I'm, I'm a proud son of this father who was the son of this one, who was the son of this one. You think we can just walk away from our entire history? But he didn't say, wajadna here. He said, alfayna. Alfa actually means what you find on the surface. Because an animal doesn't dig underneath to eat. Well, the sheep doesn't dig under the ground to eat. What does it eat? Whatever it finds on the surface. Right? Whatever surface level, you know, investigation. These are materialistic surface level people. They don't think deeply. Ma alfayna alehi abaana. Allah says, "Awalu kana abauhum la yalamu la yaqiluna shay'an wa la yahtadun." Wasn't it the case that their fathers also weren't thinking? They didn't think at all. They weren't committed to guidance at all. Now we come to the example. Let me paint this picture for you. This is not a picture of one piece to one piece. It's an entire image, entire scene, a situation compared to a situation. Think of it like that. Al-hay'a bil hay'a. So how do we make sense of it? The shepherd, you know, I watched a few videos today of shepherds to understand this ayah. The shepherd is, you know, herding his sheep. And I really wanted to hear, what does he say to the sheep? And some of them say, ah, la, 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 la. Others say, burr, burr. like one of them is doing a ringtone. The other one is saying, ka, 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 ka. like they have, they have their own vocabulary. <laughs> and they don't have the same one, right? And they, there was even this one video Jawad showed me today where they had this, these sheep were spread everywhere. And they said, oh, what, is, what did the sheep listen to? He said, ka, 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 ka. So they had some tourists come. And one tourist said, ka, 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 ka. They didn't listen. The other one said, gug, 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 gug. they didn't listen. And then the shepherd came and he said, gug, 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 and they all showed up. They know who to follow. But it's the same vocabulary. It's not like they said a different khutbah. It was the same khutbah. Why did they follow that one? Because they're tuned to a frequency. It's this, they know this is the one we're supposed to follow. Now the thing is, the one who's speaking, the shepherd who's speaking, he also knows that he is saying meaningless words. Yes? He's saying something that has no deeper meaning behind it. He's not saying, my, my beautiful sheep, I love you, come here, I wish to protect you. He's not saying any of that. He's just making sounds. And the sheep, they don't hear this and say, oh my God, I'm so inspired. Now I realize why I must come to you. They just hear the sound and they come. They come. Why do they come then? Why do sheep respond to these sounds? The, 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 the shepherd himself knows he's making a mindless sound. And the sheep are mindless to the sound, but they respond. The, the, the reason for that is hereditary. So sheep are uh, uh, herd creatures. They're too weak to protect themselves alone. So they stick together. And they, they, even without the, in, the, in the absence of human beings, they choose a leader among themselves. What shepherds do is they assume the place of that leader, and they lead them. And how do they lead? They constantly give them food in the beginning. 
So the sheep associate the shepherd with our provider. Then the, sh- the shepherd always shoes away a fox or other animals away from them, and the sheep observe this, and they see him as the provider and the protector. Then the shepherd leads them off the mountain through the, all the way to the grass. He leads them to the grass. And then he leads them back to their homes. So they see them as the guide. So I've given you three words now. Provider, protector, and guide. Provider, protector, and guide. Then because sheeps are herd followers, when two sheep come, what happens to the third and the fourth? They come. Then the fifth, then the sixth, then all of them come. Then all of them come. And the one or two stragglers that are lazy or a little slow like some of your cousins, the, sh- the shepherd comes and hits them with a stick a little bit, they come too. So now they know, if you, get stayed, if you stay behind, the shepherd will be upset with you. He'll hit you. You don't want to get hit, you follow. So safety also, right? So fear is part of the reason too that they follow. So what were the, list the reasons again for me. He's the, the shepherd is their provider, right? That's why they follow him. What else? He's the protector. He's their guide. And now he, he's also their, he's also, they're also, Afraid of him. They're also afraid of him. Allah says, the example of the kuffar is the example of someone who makes a mindless cry. Making a cry to someone who cannot hear anything except calls and cries. But they respond anyway, don't they? Right? And Allah is saying that even the people that are calling you to, to their religion or calling you away from Allah's deen, even they know that what they're saying is empty. Even they know it's just That's all it is They know And you refuse to think And you just follow Because you're programmed to follow Someone before you followed You were born into a, a, a herd of sheep Where everybody was following this So you were grazed, cultivated, cultured Into following this This is just what you do It's natural response to you You don't even think about it That's just what you're supposed to do You know Like the, you know, the, 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 bell, ex- the bell experiment with the dog Pavlov's dog it's like that, you just respond to the instinct. Then you want to protect yourself, and the only way to protect yourself is do what everybody else is doing. That's the only safe way. If you want to be part of this herd, this is your safety. And if you don't follow this, where are you going to get grass? Who's going to feed you? If you don't follow this, then you're not going to have your normal routine where you get, you're safe. And you don't want to make them mad. They're the ones who take care of you. Don't make them mad. These are all the reasons why somebody would think I shouldn't come towards Allah. I shouldn't come towards Islam because if I come towards Islam, my herd, my shepherd will be upset. And all the other sheep who are mindlessly following will say, You crazy? Why aren't you coming? He called us. So everybody's going to look at me funny. I'm going to be the, the only one left out. Human beings are also herd animals. If we don't have the ruh, the power of the ruh inside, we also herd animals. One of the most amazing social psychology experiments in my college days in 1765 was uh, the, so the social psychology experiment of consensus. It's called consensus. 500 students in a classroom, you give every, they're accounting students, so they know how to do good math without a calculator. The professor comes in, gives everybody the same question. He puts it on the board. Please solve this problem, 363 multiplied by 214. Please give me the answer. So that's what he puts on the board. And there's like 500 students. And they all start on paper calculating and writing the answer. It's a multiplication. It's not a complicated problem, right? But it takes 20 seconds. So they solve the problem. He asked the first one, the second one, the third one, the fourth one. They all start saying the answer. They all start saying the same answer. But what they, don't, what they didn't tell you is there was two people in the auditorium or one person in the auditorium. They don't know that all the other 499 people were told to say the same wrong answer. So only one guy know, doesn't know that everybody else is being already rigged to say the wrong answer. So they go to one student, second student, third student, and the guy who doesn't know, he's like... And he starts thinking, did I, did I do the wrong calculation? So he starts doing the calculation over again. And he does it over again. And he does it over again. And every time he gets the same answer, but it's not the answer that they're giving. They're giving a different answer. Oh, this is crazy. And the professor also, he picks one from this corner, from that corner, this one, that one, people who don't know each other. So this guy's even more like, what's going on? Everybody's following. I'm the only one who's right. This. So then finally, after 10, 15 people, they go to the guy that's being tested. What's your answer? You know what he says? 
99% of the time, 98 to 99% of the time, you know what he says? The answer that everybody else gave. And when, when he gives that answer, the experiment is over, privately they ask him, why did you give the wrong answer? There's only two responses. One response is, everybody else thought this was wrong, so how could I be the only one who's right? If so many people are following it, it has to be right. If all the horses are jumping off a cliff, so that's what you got to do is jump off a cliff. How can everybody be wrong? Have you heard some version of that in, in your life? Oh yeah? Everybody else is wrong? You're the only one who's right? Your cousin did it. Your uncle did it. This one did it. This one did it. Oh, they're all going to Jahannam. You're the one, only one going to Jannah, huh? Somebody opens up uh, you know, uh, a restaurant. Sales are not going so well. So they open up a bar too. Halal restaurant with a bar. I've seen that a few times in Europe. I went to one place, I couldn't, I was looking for a halal restaurant, finally found one. I walk in, huge liquor cabinet, huge. In the middle, there's a space for like a frame of Ayatul Kursi. And I was like, yo, mm. whew. <laughs> this is his insurance policy. <laughs> when the angels come and get him, he's like, let's just look at this one. <laughs> what games are you playing? But anyway, so they have, they're like, if everybody's doing it, I must, doesn't matter how many times I disagreed, it's impossible that I'm the only one who's right and everybody else is wrong. That was one kind of answer. Another kind of answer was even more interesting. You know what he said? The, these people said? They said, I knew I was right. I knew it. I knew everybody was wrong. But the problem is, if I said the right answer, everybody would look at me funny. I didn't want everybody looking at me. I like to fit in. One kind of herd mentality is, the herd is always right. The other kind of herd mentality is, even if the herd is wrong, stick with the herd. Stick with the herd. This is herd mentality. The, the example of the kuffar is both of these herd mentalities. They hear a mindless cry. They have a mindless response. Can't use your mind. Somebody will do the thinking for you. In both of those, somebody else did the thinking for you, all 499 people did the thinking for you, you can shut your brain off. And even if your brain is working, shut it off and just follow them. That's, that's the idea. Sommun, bukmun, umyun. Once you understand this, this idea, then you'll see, like, you know, um, that's an old example, but like, how many people are into cars? I'm into cars. You know what car companies do really well? They sell you the new model and make you feel bad about your model. If you bought a 2018 anything, then when the 2020 comes out, or 2019 comes out, they take the headlights that were here, and they move them over one inch. And all of a sudden, like, yo, you see the new headlights, what? And they take the grill that was going like this, and it's, now it's going like this. So for the engineers, it was just moving plastic. That's all it was. The engineering is the same, the engine is the same, the horsepower is the same, the mechanics are the same, the performance is the same, the durability is the same, maybe even worse. What's changed? The look a little bit. To make it feel like this is newer. Why are you getting it? Because it's the new one. I have, I have to get it. New iPhone comes out. There's a longer line for that than the line for applications for Hajj. Right? <laughs> you have to have it. It came out and I don't have it? You know? <laughs> There's a mindlessness. They just have to make a call. Kick, 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 kick. And you respond without thinking, I just do it. This, this is what you're supposed to do. What do you mean? Why do you want to get this brand of clothes? Why, do you want to, why can't you get something else? Why do you have to live in this neighborhood? Why not somewhere else? What, and you find the answer being mindless every time, every single time. وَمَثَلُ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا كَمَثَلِ الَّذِي يَنْعِقُوا بِمَا لَا يَسْمَعُوا إِلَّا دُعَاءً وَنِدَاءً Then Allah took this back to the same old example. This is what I'll conclude with today. صُمٌ بُكْمٌ عُمْيٌ فَهُمْ لَا يَعْقِلُونَ فِي الْمَرَّ الْأُولَى قَالْ صُمٌ بُكْمٌ عُمْيٌ فَهُمْ لَا يَرْجِعُونَ The first example was, they are deaf, they're mute, they're blind, they will not come back. Remember, they won't come back. Now he's saying, and they won't think, they won't understand. Now, coming back is to come back to your essence. One way you can think about that is, Allah gave us a ruh, Allah gave us something profound inside, the knowledge of Allah, the fitrah, and you will come back to that fitrah. But if you're so far gone in the desert and the lights are off, you didn't follow the one who kindled the light, 
then there's no way you'll come back. Now Allah is giving us the next insight. Summun bukmun umyun, the same words again. The reason you won't come back is because you don't want you no longer think. Fahum la yaqilun. So they don't use their intellect, they don't use their minds. I say I share this with you not just as a criticism of other religions. To be honest with you, what terrifies me is that we are not that different anymore, a good number of us Muslims. We're not thoughtful Muslims. We don't want to think about the Qur'an. In fact, there are many cultures in the world today where Muslim, young Muslims are told, don't read the Qur'an, it is for experts. It's not for you. You want to recite it? Good. You want to memorize some of it? Excellent. You want to fix your tajweed? Beautiful. The sounds? Great. Thinking about the Qur'an, that's not for you. You have to have a degree first. You have to go get a degree, then you can think about the Qur'an. Asking questions about the Qur'an, you know, that's not for you. That's for the ulama. You know, the ulama's job is to spend time learning and understanding the Book of Allah to the best of their ability. So when you are thinking about the Book of Allah and you have a question about something, you have someone to go to. The point wasn't, you stop thinking, they'll do all the thinking. You don't have to do any of the thinking. That was the religions that came before us. That was the religions that had the relationship of the shepherd and the sheep. And it's so beautiful that in this religion, Allah took the example of the shepherd and the sheep. Usually, in other religious traditions, the shepherd is an image of the religious leader. And the, his, the shepherd and his flock. Jesus is a shepherd. right? And in other religious traditions, and even other literature, when you say your heart is stone, that's supposed to be something bad. And what did Allah do in both cases? Allah took something that looks bad and turned it into something good. The hearts were compared to hearts, and hearts explode, rocks explode like hearts explode with iman. Or rocks, so rocks became something. You didn't expect rocks to be something good. And Allah took the example of rocks and made it into something good. The same way the shepherd and the sheep, you would think, oh, this is about the prophet and the followers. It's not. It's actually also about society at large. In fact, these people, when they make these calls, one interpretation of this ayah was also secondarily, oh, someone who calls, makes the call of the animal, and he doesn't hear anything except these sounds. Nobody's listening to him. Like, imagine some shepherd at the edge of a mountain, and he's making, kah, 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 and he only hears his own echo. And it's an, it's an empty sound. Almost a criticism of those who were doing shirk, making all kinds of prayers in front of statues, and those statues were supposed to respond to them. No, the only one who's hearing their cries right now is yourself. Nobody else hears this. There's no reality to this thing in front of you. And you know what's even funnier? A lot of the religious traditions that had gods, multiple gods, each god, many of the gods look like animals. Did you know that? Some gods look like a sheep, a ram. Some gods look like a goat. Some gods look like a cow, etc., etc. What's, what's remarkable about that is human beings domesticate animals and now you're worshipping the animal. And you would think they're serving their gods. They're not serving their gods, the gods are serving them. Just like the animal serves the human being, they created religions in which the gods serve the human being. So what happened was, we need rain, so we need a god for the rain. Oh, I can't have children, we need a god for fertility. Oh, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of war in our area, we need a, the god for war that can prepare us for battle. We need a god for protection. We need a god for this, we need a god for this, we need a god for this. So they had different gods for different problems, right? And basically, just like for animals, if you want the sheep to give you wool and the sheep to give you milk, you better provide it grass. You take care of it, then it will take care of you. Well, these gods, you better sacrifice an animal in front of it. You better perform these rituals in front of it. You give them something, then they'll give you something. You have to sacrifice something for your gods before your gods will give you back something. You, you have to give God something before He gives you anything. By the way, the Qur'an completely destroyed this idea. Allah is ar-Rahman, ar-Rahim. Human beings give Allah or don't give Allah, worship Allah or don't worship Allah, thank Allah or don't thank Allah, they all get to breathe. They all get to live. They all get to enjoy life. Even the ungrateful ones. Even the atheist who curses Allah, who curses Allah's Prophet والسلام, gets to breathe in and breathe out the air that Allah created. His lungs still obey Allah. His heartbeat still obeys Allah. And Allah didn't ask for anything in return. You know? So th this is, you know, you know, مَا أُرِيدُ مِنْكُمْ مِنْ رِزْقٍ وَمَا أُرِيدُ أَنْ يُطْعِمُونَ مِنْهُمْ مِنْ رِزْقٍ وَمَا أُرِيدُ أَنْ يُطْعِمُونَ I don't want them to provide me any risk. I don't want them to feed me. إِنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ الرَّزَاقِ Allah is the one that provides. <laughs> You're not the one who provides. But in all of these religions, you have to provide something to the God. And then you get something. 
you know, say five Hail Marys and put five dollars in the box, then, then it'll come back to you. So God's being at your service, basically. It's a service religion. It's consumer religion. This is the last thought I'll share with you for this evening, inshallah, about this, this remarkable parable, is that Allah Azza wa Jal made us, gave us a religion. If you study Quran, even just Al-Baqarah, even if you just study Al-Baqarah carefully, one thing you will come away with is this religion does not let you follow Allah's book without using your mind. You have to use your mind. You have to be thoughtful people. You have to be thinkers. Allah expects human beings to be thinkers. Even before the coming of revelation, He was expecting us to think about creation. He was expecting that from us. He keeps saying, لِقَوْمٍ يَعْقِلُونَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَفَكَّرُونَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَعْقِلُونَ He keeps saying, think, understand, think, understand, think, understand. So if we create a culture of Muslims that promotes not thinking, just following. Not thinking, just following. Then that might work temporarily for one or two generations. But what's going to happen when the world moves towards critical thinking, as it has now? What happens when every young boy or girl who even memorized the Qur'an has uh, TikTok and they've got an entire channel dedicated to atheism or entire channels dedicated to why LGBT makes sense or entire channels dedicated to the scientific arguments for homosexuality, etc, etc, etc. And they're like, these people are thinking. Let me ask what uh, my mom says about this. And she says, Don't, oh, no, 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 I have to put your, make wudu, let me put your water, put your phone in zamzam. Let me take you to an imam who will do ruqya on you. The problem will go away. No, but I'm asking you a thoughtful question. I, can, I, can I engage in conversation? No, 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 no. We don't do that. We don't do that. We just follow. Why should I pray, mom? Because your mother said to pray. Why, why, why did you say? Because Allah said. Why did Allah say? Who's Allah? I like a The kid is thinking. Look at his thing, and you're, you're stopping him from thinking. So you're, you're, you're projecting onto the next generation that this religion can only be followed if you don't think. The tragedy of that is, this is the one religion that came in the history of religions that constantly challenged human beings to think. It challenged human beings to think. Now we're turning it into the very thing that Allah criticized. This is, this is our betrayal of Allah's book. We have to undo that betrayal. We have to become mindful followers of Allah's book. Mindful thinkers of Allah's book. And we have to raise generations, especially those of you that have children that are memorizing Qur'an or have finished memorizing the Qur'an. It's your, I would argue, not even it would be nice, it's your obligation to make them mindful students of the Qur'an. Mindful students of Allah's book. Because that is what Allah expects from this ummah. May Allah Azza wa Jal not make us the sheep that just follow calls and cries. And may Allah Azza wa Jal help us rise above these mindless calls of consumerism and cultural trends that once we learn to think critically, we're not going to be swayed by the entire crowd of sheep that is going in one direction. We will happily go in the opposite direction. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bil ayat wa dhikr al-Hakim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Thank you so much.